Okay, so welcome to uh, this week's uh, seminar of the IA. Uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Chiara Matsukeli. Uh, Chiara uh, got uh, her uh, PhD um, around three years ago uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg uh, under the uh, group of uh, Fabian Walter. And then uh, she immediately moved to uh, Chile as, a, as an ESO fellow. Uh, and since then, she's uh, uh, working uh, at Paranal uh, as a, a lead of which uh, instrument? Uh, are you? I am part of the Chemos instrument uh, group. Yeah. Excellent. So today, uh, Chiara is going to talk us about uh, quasars at the epoch of uh, reionization, their uh, properties and environment. So whenever you want. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Tanya, and also thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here and talk uh, as on some aspects of uh, quasars in the epoch of reionization. So uh, I would like to start with some introductory slide on uh, quasars in general and why we should care about them and in particular in this uh, age of the universe. So I show you here the one of the most famous uh, plot for um, active galactic nuclei from Urien Padovani, uh, which shows uh, one of the schematics of the structures of uh, AGN, uh, which are indeed the luminous sources where the material accretes onto the central uh, active supermassive black hole. Basically, quasars are a subgroup of AGN, uh, where in this uh, um, schematic view, we are seeing the AGN um, sort of face on, where we can observe the, the broad line uh, regions and the broad, line, the broad lines. On the other hand, uh, quasars are not only um, observed in this uh, orientation and schematic view, uh, but they are also seen as a, a state in the evolution of massive galaxies. For instance, uh, I really like this depiction here from Hopkins uh, from 2007, where you see basically uh, the interactions between uh, two massive galaxies that force on uh, merge and with the coalescence of both the gas and the two uh, black holes merging in the center. Uh, with a peak on the star formation rate of the uh, galaxy itself. For Theron, we have a blowout phase in which the dust and the gas is being basically uh, blown out by the feedback of the central source. And we have the uh, so-called quasar phase uh, with the uh, most uh, traditional uh, quasar period in which we see the uh, central engine naked, quote unquote. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I said, we are interested in this type of sources in the epoch of reionization. So uh, again, show you here a very simplified uh, way of seeing uh, the history of the universe from the Big Bang to what we observe nowadays. And uh, one of the main uh, phases of this history is the uh, so-called epoch of reionization. That's where um, the first stars and galaxies uh, formed and started rionizing the precedent neutral medium, ending the dark ages and bringing to the ionized state of the universe as we see it nowadays. So we think that the epoch of reionization is ending by redshift 5.76, so in within one billion year from the Big Bang. At the same time, this epoch is indeed very interesting for us to study, but regular uh, star forming galaxies are extremely faint at this redshift. And sometimes they're even hard to spectroscopically confirm, therefore it's uh, very hard to study their properties observational wise. On the other hand, uh, we can uh, uh, indeed use uh, and reverse to extremely luminous quasars that can be observed very uh, far away very in, in a very um, early universe, and therefore they can be excellent beacons of the state of the uh, universe at that time. 
One other thing that I uh, think is very impressive and very interesting about this type of sources is that they can indeed emit over a large range uh, in wavelength and the different uh, part of the wavelength emissions can also provide us a lot of information on the sources themselves. For instance, uh, we can focus on the emission in the rest frame UV and optical, uh, which is uh, mainly due to the nuclear non thermal emission from the accretion disk close to the black hole and the broad and narrow line regions. If we want to zoom in and focus on what we can learn from this particular region of the spectrum, in, um, especially at high redshift, um, in order to do this, I show you uh, a, a spectrum in the rest frame UV and optical, which is shifted in the infrared due to the, uh, due to the redshift indeed, for the quasar ULAS J1120 at redshift 7, uh, which was the uh, highest redshift quasar for almost 10 years, basically. In this case, you can see that the shape of the continuum is that of a power law, and over in post, we have broad emission lines. And uh, we can use uh, some of these features in order to derive uh, a variety of uh, uh, physical properties of these objects. For instance, we can focus on the magnesium-2 emission line in order to derive the uh, mass of the central black hole and uh, study their formation and growth in the early universe. On the other hand, we can also focus on other lines, such as the C4 emission line, to study the broadland region uh, dynamics for the presence, uh, for instance, of uh, ejecta and winds. And finally, uh, we can also um, derive constraints and consider um, other emission lines, such as the iron 2, uh, which is basically a pseudo continuum in this case, uh, in order to uh, constrain uh, the chemical evolution uh, of the broadline regions over cosmic time. Uh, another aspect of the SEDs of Quasar, basically, that I would uh, focus on is uh, that coming from the far infrared, um, rest frame far infrared, which is mainly due uh, to the cool gas and dust arising from the interstellar medium in the host galaxy. And another important line in this case is the C plus emission line. This is particularly important or interesting at high redshift because the emission uh, from the stars is basically um, completely overwhelmed by the emission from the Christian disk and the emission of the quasar itself. Therefore, uh, we have not observed uh, stars at high redshift yet, and in order to uh, derive constraints on the host galaxy, we, um, we, we can obtain them with observations uh, in these wavelengths. These, wa these wavelengths are actually uh, redshifted in the sublimiter regime at this redshift, and therefore can be studied by instruments uh, or facilities such as NOIMA and ALMA in Chile. Uh, over the last years, there has been a boom, basically, of uh, um, host galaxies of Irish quasars that have been observed with these uh, techniques, uh, both in terms of the continuum emission in the C+, and other lines such as the CO-65, for example. And all of, these, uh, um, all of these studies have basically shown us that um, quasars at high redshift are hosted by massive galaxies with high infrared and C plus luminosities, and that are um, fastly accreting stars with star formation rates over a few hundreds solar masses per year up to uh, thousands of solar masses per year. So basically, these quasars at high redshift are both hosting um, very massive black holes in their centers, and they are found in very massive galaxies. So for the rest of my talk, I will follow basically this uh, outline, uh, trying to answer some questions. Uh, first of all, I hope I, I have convinced you that the quasars at high redshift are interesting to study, but what is the current sample and how we can find them? And later on, I will uh, move basically on a multi-scale level, let's say, uh, first focusing on some of the properties of their innermost regions, and then uh, um, talking about to, a bit of what their environments are and where do we uh, find actually these type of sources. And finally, uh, what is the role and the presence of uh, radio jets at, uh, at these redshifts and in these sources? Okay, starting from the first point. Um, how do we find higher sheet quasars? We can uh, rely upon some of the properties of the quasars themselves and the universe, let's say. Indeed, uh, at increasing redshift, uh, we have two effects coming. On one hand, we have that increasingly neutral intergalactic medium between us, the observer, and the quasar is basically absorbing the quasar emission blue words of the Lyman R towards 
lowers with respect to the lambda and alpha at specific wavelengths, which are basically corresponding to the uh, lambda alpha emission at those redshifts, which uh, leaves basically a hole in the quasar spectrum. On the other hand, with the entire quasar spectrum and lambda and alpha with it is redshifted at longer wavelength. And these two effects are basically um, the root cause of the very particular shape of quasars uh, spectra at high redshift, as you can see here in a collection of sources. This is basically reflected um, on the fact that these sources have very peculiar colors uh, when they are observed with uh, optical and near infrared broadband filters. These peculiar colors are placing them in particular regions of color color plots, uh, thanks to which they can be selected over the main contaminants, uh, which are basically uh, brown dwarf and cool stars found in our own uh, galaxy. Um, finally, we want to also consider that higher shift quasars are extremely rare. For instance, here I show the number density as a function of redshift with a peak around cosmic uh, noon and uh, a sharp decrease at redshift around six and seven, where we expect less than one object per gigaparsec cube. Um, one because we consider the two things together, so we need uh, optical and infrared imaging over a large range of the sky in order to find the sources. We're basically left indeed with relying on large uh, optical and infrared sky surveys. Uh, I list here some of them, for instance, PANSTARS and SCSS and HSC in the um, optical regime, and UKIDS, UHS, and VHS in the infrared, um, near infrared, and uh, WISE and now the near WISE reduction for the um, infrared regime. Uh, okay, once we can uh, know a bit how we find this type of sources, what is the status of the sample nowadays? Basically, the first uh, quasars that received greater than four were found uh, at the beginning of the 2000s by Shawi Fan. And there has, there has been from there a uh, fast increase and a drastic uh, increase in, the, in these numbers in the last uh, 20 years. So the situation started to grow, for instance, uh, um, at the beginning of the 2010s, up to uh, almost 60 sources found, thanks to uh, surveys such as the SPSS mainly and uh, UKIDS. And later on, there have been a large, larger increase up to, for instance, 2017, with uh, almost 200 sources uh, found thanks to PANSTARS and Viking and DAS that came into play. And finally, the situation nowadays is that we have, and we know more than 300 of these sources, uh, with a sharp increase, especially at the lowest luminosities, thanks to uh, the effort by Japanese group uh, with the uh, Hyper Supreme Camera Survey, which goes uh, extremely deep. And so, uh, as you can see here, we have basically moved from in, tw in 20 years, roughly, uh, from uh, a few studies of uh, peculiar objects uh, and extreme objects to a statistically um, significant sample or a sample that we can um, start observing as a, as a whole. And I report here a collection of um, of references uh, of discoveries of higher shift quasars, where you can also look at if you're interested in more details about uh, their selections with the different uh, surveys. So as uh, again, a point of summary, uh, we have seen there's a large number of the sources, and this means that we can move to an ever increasing multi-wavelength and multi-scale studies of their properties. Moving now to their uh, properties of innermost regions, I will first focus on their black holes and what we can learn about their accretion. Um, so in this case, we can consider uh, the, pro uh, the properties of their black holes thanks to the uh, modeling of the uh, magnesium-2 emission line region. In particular, thanks to the um, virial assumptions, we can link the width, the fluidal maximum, of the magnesium to emission line uh, with the velocity of the proton regions on one hand. And on the other, we have the emission of the continuum is linked thanks to reverberation mapping studies at uh, lower redshift uh, to uh, the uh, uh, radius of the proton region. So once we have these two uh, factors, uh, we can derive uh, the mass, which is producing the gravitational well, basically, where these proton regions are moving, uh, which is that of the, uh, of the black hole. In this case, uh, we did this uh, back in 2017. I plot here uh, the uh, black hole masses as a function of bolometric luminosity. 
And in red, you see uh, the sample in, at that time of uh, results at redshift greater than 6.5, and in black, the um, SDSS results at lower redshift. The uh, dashed, well, the vertical lines, uh, diagonal lines really, are uh, Lossy of uh, um, constant adding to luminosity, uh, which is basically uh, the um, maximum luminosity, uh, which we think a quasar can, uh, or black hole can accrete while in equilibrium. So we can also derive this called adding to ratio, which is the ratio between the polymetric luminosity and the adding to luminosity. And once this is close to one, um, it means that the object in principle is accreting at the maximum speed. So something which is already noticeable here is that these sources are basically already found in the same regions uh, at the highest redshift and at, um, at the lower redshift and up to um, black hole masses of uh, a few per 10 to the nine solar masses. Um, once we compare actually uh, the mean properties of this sample at the highest redshift with a volumetric luminosity matched sample of quasars at lower redshift, we however do not see um, very strong differences in their properties. In particular, it seems that these objects are accreting at slightly higher adding to an ratio, but uh, with a not um, very strong uh, um, constraints, let's say. Uh, this experiment was also repeated at um, very, more recently uh, by Shen with a larger sample of quasars at uh, redshift greater than 5.7. And the mm, plots are basically very similar with a, a comparison of the distributions of the um, an intoneration of quasars at the highest redshift and the control sample at uh, from the CSS. And also in this case, it is found that there's not a strong or significant difference in how much uh, or how fast they accrete. So basically, uh, we think to see that quasars at redshift uh, roughly six accrete at comparable rates uh, with respect to volumetric luminosity match sample at uh, intermediate redshift. As I said, we can also consider other emission lines in order to uh, constrain other properties of the Brooklyn regions, in particular, the properties of the C4 emission lines. I'll show you here a plot of the equivalent width with respect to the blue shift, again, with comparison of quasar uh, uh, samples at different red shift. And in this case, we could already see it back in 2017 that it seemed that quasars at red shift uh, greater than 6.5 showed a uh, um, very strong blue shift of the uh, C4 lines, which uh, might signal the presence of uh, ejecta or uh, winds. And this was basically confirmed as well uh, with more recent studies by J.T. Schindler, uh, with uh, again a larger sample of quasars down to redshift greater than 5.8, roughly. And you see the blue shift of the um, C4 with respect to the redshift of the sources, uh, with a uh, systematic increase at um, redshift from 6 to 7. So in this case, it seems to be that for these uh, high redshift sources, we see a strong and systematic uh, C4 blue shift, um, which may signal a strong winds in the broadland regions. Um, this is basically seen uh, up at the highest redshift uh, that we have achieved uh, so far. Uh, with uh, uh, I show you here basically the spectra of the uh, two highest redshift sources known, which are J0313 and J1342 at redshift 7.6 and 7.5. And in both of these cases, we see that the C4 blue shift is uh, very, very high, both with respect to the magnesium 2 line and the C plus line. In particular, for the highest redshift quasar, we can also see the presence of strong broad absorption lines, features which are both blue shifted from C4 and at a lower significance from the silicon 4 and magnesium 2, uh, which suggests the presence again of strong winds uh, in this time with an absorption feature. Uh, let me get to the final point that I also listed before in the introduction. So what we can learn about the uh, chemical composition and evolution in these sources, uh, we can uh, try to put some constraints on this uh, thanks to the comparison between alpha elements, such as the magnesium 2, and elements such as iron. So it is uh, thought that magnesium 2 and alpha elements in general are mainly produced by uh, type 2 supernovae, while iron by type 1a, uh, which again are estimated to be the 
laid by one giga year with respect to, um, to type 2 supernovae, um, which means that if we observe sources uh, which are found in the universe uh, at um, an age uh, smaller than one giga year from the Big Bang, basically, we might expect to see a depletion in iron or at least a change in what we see in the local universe. And this experiment was indeed done by comparing the uh, flux ratios between these two lines as a proxy of the abundance ratio with respect to redshift for samples of quasars and uh, uh, up to uh, redshift 7.5. This from uh, the study from Masafusa Norway in 2020. And what uh, we could basically see in this case is that uh, we do not see a strong evolution in this ratio with respect to redshift, uh, which is uh, indeed uh, quite surprising. Again, as a summary, uh, we can see that the black holes masses are already uh, very large, but they seem, these objects seem to be accreting uh, at similar uh, paces with respect to what we observed uh, from CSS. And at the same time, there's a hints of strong winds and outflows in already evolved uh, broadline regions. Um, at this point, let me uh, open a bit of the focus of uh, our uh, study and presentation of quasars at high redshift and uh, uh, briefly talk on what we know about uh, the environments where do they live. And as one slight introduction on why we should care and what kind of questions these uh, reply, uh, we have basically already seen that these sources are both uh, found in very massive and some forbidden galaxies and uh, host very uh, massive uh, black holes, uh, which means that there needs to be a lot of gas feeding these sources. Um, theoretical uh, studies and modeling basically answer the question where all this gas coming from by placing uh, high redshift quasars in biased regions of the early universe uh, at the correspondence of the high density peaks of the dark matter um, distribution at that time. And in this case, they um, are surrounded by over densities of uh, galaxies. Therefore, these high redshift quasars can also be used as the signpost for the first uh, protocluster, let's say. Well, this is, seems to be quite uh, um, pointed, let's say, in the uh, theoretical side. On the, on the observational studies part, it is uh, still um, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's still a puzzle. Indeed, there are uh, relatively few high redshift quasars fields studied at redshift uh, greater than five uh, so far, which still uh, provides um, non univocal results. Indeed, some of these fields provide uh, over, find over densities, while others do not find over densities. And some of the fields are even studied with different techniques by different groups and uh, finding uh, uh, opposite results or different results. One of the uh, points that uh, we need to underline in this case, that is that these fields uh, have been inspected mainly by searching for rest frame UV bright galaxies, such as lemon bright galaxies and lemon alpha emitters, uh, which can be selected uh, with techniques uh, very similar to what uh, I showed you before in terms of polar colors for quasars, but uh, needs uh, deep, uh, broad, and narrow band imaging. At this point, uh, we can uh, ask ourselves, um, what about if these uh, overdensities are indeed found, but they are not uh, dominated by uh, UV bright sources, but instead by uh, dust obscured sources close to the quasar? And as I uh, was saying to you before, there has been a large uh, number of studies with uh, ALMA and OIMA basically, uh, pointed at studying the host galaxies of these high redshift quasars. And in this large number of studies, uh, it was very surprising uh, that we serendipitously um, found a large number of companion galaxies in the, uh, the submillimeter data, which were closed both in terms of uh, um, delta V of the C plus emission line and uh, in physical scale to the quasar uh, itself. And this has been found basically from the highest redshift uh, and uh, down to redshift uh, uh, five, uh, for instance, by uh, Benny Trachtenbrot and Nitan Nguyen. So in this case, these uh, companion galaxies are extremely interesting uh, because they also show uh, some limited properties uh, very similar to that of the host galaxy of the quasar itself. So uh, large C plus and infrared luminosities and large star formation rates. 
What I uh, find also very interesting about the sources is that uh, uh, if we actually uh, plot their cumulative number uh, of the companions per field as a function of projected distance with respect to the quasar and compare them uh, with what is uh, uh, expected in the case of a background, uh, so in case of no density, which are two dash dashed lines in case you consider different types of backgrounds, and with what is uh, expected in case of a strong clustering of sources, you may we see basically that these companions are consistent with what is expected in case of uh, highly overdense regions in the early universe. And these uh, sources have been basically followed up uh, by um, a large number of studies, basically, uh, with uh, uh, higher signal to noise and higher resolution uh, with ALMA. And uh, I find it uh, very interesting that we see basically a large variety of uh, kiloparsec scale environments around this uh, high ratio quasar. For instance, we can try to group uh, these uh, uh, companion fields, let's say, as uh, uh, a function of the physical distance of the interaction. And we see, for instance, uh, sources and objects where the companion is found uh, up to a few tens of kiloparsec from uh, the quasar, or cases in which the two massive galaxies, the host of the uh, quasar and the companion, is found getting closer and closer, uh, up to um, cases in which the morphology is uh, highly uh, disturbed and uh, it is uh, a, remind, a remind us of a later stage uh, merger basically. And I think it is uh, quite remarkable that this basically reminds me of the scheme that we have seen back in the introduction of the presence of a small group and interaction of massive galaxies and down to uh, the merger phase. And it is, again, quite uh, fascinating, I think, that we can start to observe this type of interactions and this type of uh, environments up to uh, the highest shift, basically. Uh, one thing that we also try to do um, to study these uh, companion galaxies is trying to uh, pinpoint their uh, pro general properties by a multi-wavelength follow-up. In this case, what we did was um, following the map with deep HST and Spitzer imaging uh, observations that were pointed uh, respectively at the rest frame UV and rest frame optical um, optical emission. Uh, basically, of the four objects in which we did this, we did not uh, obtain a um, stronger uh, or a significant uh, detection in this wavelength uh, for three out of four of these objects. And I'll just show you here one example. Uh, still, with these uh, constraints, we can try to uh, model their, uh, or, well, uh, compare their spectral energy distribution with what is uh, observed uh, for different types of galaxies in the local universe, for instance, from star forming galaxies to ARP to 20 like galaxies. And uh, we did this by pinpointing these observed uh, SEDs uh, with respect to the ALMA uh, data. And we basically saw the bottom line in this uh, is that the SEDs of this companion are consistent with being up to 20 light galaxies at uh, redshift 6. Uh, we can also try to place them in the context of both uh, galaxies at uh, lower redshift, such as the one from the Cantor surveys, and uh, galaxies at the highest redshift, for instance, millimeter galaxies and LBGs. And in this particular case, I plot here the obscured fraction of star formation as a function of stellar mass. So for the three objects for which we do not detect uh, any emission in this wavelength, uh, we see that the uh, fraction of obscured star formation is up to basically the 99%. But even for the one object, which is the companion of the quasar 167 at redshift 6.5, for which we do detect an emission in the HST imaging, uh, we still see that the uh, fraction of obscure star formation is uh, uh, up to almost 80%. So basically, these sources are extremely uh, dominated by this uh, um, obscured fraction. And at the same time, you can also place them in uh, the context of the main sequence of surforming galaxies at, the, at these redshifts. And if you can believe that these things exist at uh, redshift six. And so in this case, it's plotted the surformation rate as a function of stellar mass. The comparison is again with the same, uh, with the same nomenclature for LBGs and inter galaxies. And uh, I also show the predictions for the main sequence in case of observations and in case of uh, simulations and modeling. 
So with the limits that we have for these sources, we basically can say that these are still consistent with being on the main sequence of uh, star forming galaxies uh, at uh, redshift six. So finally, uh, some matter of, uh, again, uh, some high points. We cannot, uh, unfortunately, still provide an observationally unique pictures of the quasar environment at redshift five, but uh, ALMA depicts a large variety of uh, environments and systems uh, in the dust obscured and gas rich universe, uh, which uh, um, can show us a large number of uh, companion galaxies. So let me go for the last part of my talk uh, to talk a bit about the roles of uh, radio jets or what we can know about this uh, in quasars. And uh, in this case, again, as a matter of introduction, where we should uh, care again by uh, the mission in the radio and in the radio jets. So radio loud quasars are basically defined as those quasars where the fraction between the observed flux in the radio, specifically at rest frame 5 gigahertz, divided by the rest frame flux in the optical or in the UV is greater than 10. And this is basically the radio loud rest parameter. We think that this radio loud fraction is roughly 10% and irrespective of that, shift. And in terms of the physical properties, the radio jets are thought to play a key role in the co-evolution of the supermassive black holes and the host galaxy by basically injecting the um, feedback in the host galaxy and the sun itself, and also by facilitating the early growth of uh, supermassive black holes by uh, facilitating the presence of uh, um, super adding to an accretion episodes. On the other hand, on the environment side, radio sources are also very interesting because they are routinely observed surrounded by over densities of galaxies over a large redshift range, basically, as observed, for instance, in the Carla sample by Dominica Villazalek, and uh, up to uh, a large over density of lamellar emitters observed around the radio galaxy back in 2004 by Bram Reynolds. The status of this sample at the highest redshift is that so far we know 27 radio sources at redshift greater than 5, uh, 17 of which are radio loud quasar. And I show you here basically the distribution of these sources where uh, there's included the radio galaxies, uh, radio loud quasars, and blazers, which are basically um, radio loud quasars in which we observe them under the direction of the jets. And uh, as you can see, um, basically from their uh, distribution in the sky, uh, they, um, these objects are highly dominated by the, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, we mainly know them in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, mainly because they were discovered thanks to the first survey, uh, which was following the SPSS uh, um, path. And again, let me uh, just spend a few words on a very recent discovery that um, we did in the highest redshift universe, and uh, which is basically the um, highest redshift radio loud quasar found um, at redshift 6.8, uh, which was recently published. And I show you here the uh, near. Um, in infrared spectrum, uh, where you can already see the presence of uh, strong emission lines, in particular the line alpha, the that it also report the photometry and the SED in the radio. And basically, this source is uh, already show is showing a, a steep a radio slope of uh, an alpha of minus 1.31, which uh, means that if we extrapolate it to the 5 gigahertz in the rest frame, it provides a radio loudness of uh, 90. Uh, just to spend a few words on some of its uh, radio properties, uh, which I find uh, very interesting. Um, I show you here basically the first data overlapped uh, in blue contours, uh, um, which are overlapped with the uh, Z decals uh, images. And these uh, um, first observations taken in 1999 were used in order to select uh, the object from the catalog. And the um, quasar in this case has shown a uh, uh, flux in the L band of 1000 microjonsky. At the same time, after we um, secured this uh, quasar candidate as, uh, as quasar in 2019, uh, we went on and we asked for follow up the LA observations, both in the L and in the S band. And these observations brought uh, more surprises than we thought. Uh, first of all, for instance, we uh, see that the flux of the quasar in the L band is of only 500 uh, microjonsky, which uh, means that basically this quasar has a uh, um, 
faded by a factor of two in the in the region in the uh, last uh, 20 years. And what I, find, what I find very interesting is also that if we would be uh, trying to select them with a survey such as FIRST, observing it nowadays, uh, we would not be able to, um, to select the source uh, because this flux is actually below the limit of the, uh, of the survey. We saw, therefore, um, follow up and monitoring uh, uh, radio observations uh, could be interesting to see if this uh, uh, variability and this fading phase is, uh, um, is going on in time indeed. Another uh, very surprising point uh, is the fact that we do not only detect the quasar in the BLA observations, but also a second source, uh, which is found 20 arc seconds away from the uh, quasar itself. And uh, it also presents a, a steep radio slope. So this uh, could be a foreground as it can be a companion source of an obscured AGN found close to, to the quasar and signaling uh, a potential over dense regions around this, uh, um, around this quasar. So follow-up observations will be able to um, pinpoint the uh, properties of this uh, companion. Finally, also let me spend a few words on the near infrared properties on the lines of what we uh, have already discussed before. Uh, this can be achieved by um, modeling the near infrared spectrum, and we show you here close up of modeling of some of the emission lines. And in particular, um, I would like again to focus the attention on the C4 and the mechanism to line. And uh, again, we can place this uh, new quasar in the context of the uh, black hole masses and uh, bolometric luminosity of uh, a quasar at the same um, FC redshift, so at high redshift, both radio quiet and radio loud. And again, a redshift uh, roughly one sources from uh, the SDSS. In this case, uh, we can basically see that the radio loud sources are among, uh, uh, at high redshift, are among the most rapidly accreting quasar at any redshift. And for instance, this new source has a identical ratio of, uh, of two. As before, we can also study their C4 properties and place this again in the context of the C4 equivalent width versus uh, blue, uh, C4 blue shift. And uh, in this case, uh, again, I plot a very similar nomenclature with the previous uh, plot on the black hole mass, but uh, the quasars at high redshift are in green. Uh, we unfortunately have constraints for only uh, very few uh, radio loud quasar at high redshift in this uh, parameter space, basically only two. Uh, but we can already see that they do not uh, show very uh, strong uh, blue shift and uh, they show. Um, weak C4 emission lines, uh, and their uh, properties are actually consistent with what is observed in the radio loud quasar sample at redshift uh, one. So it would be very interesting to follow up more um, radio loud quasars at the highest redshift in order to see if there's actually um, a confirmation of these trends, so them being extremely fast creating, uh, and at the same time um, having broadened region properties, at least in terms of the C4 emission line, similar to what is observed um, at the lowest redshift. Uh, so again, I um, show you here the summary again. This radio loud uh, um, sample, I think, is particularly interesting in order to study the uh, feedback of the radio jets, but also how the uh, accretion happens in terms of the black hole and the broadly regions. And I think that there's a large uh, range of uh, future studies for this uh, for this sample. And uh, let me just get maybe a couple of more slides on what is the future in this case of high redshift quasars and what we can learn now basically that uh, many more facilities are coming um, are coming on and uh, basically this is a very golden age for high redshift quasars and uh, i think we're all very excited by the new facilities coming online uh, for instance uh, uh, we are basically entering in the jwst era uh, where we can uh, point to a large variety of uh, um, of studies, uh, thanks to NIRCAM, NIRSPEC, and uh, NIRI, uh, where we will be able to uh, pinpoint uh, many of the properties for the first time, such as, for instance, the emission from the uh, from the stars in the host galaxy, as it has not been uh, detected before, or the H alpha or H beta lines that has not been indeed detected before in high redshift quasars, or the contribution of the uh, dust to Taurus, which is mainly unconstrained. And one of the things that really uh, is remarkable is that uh, 
uh, there's a large number of GTO and GEO cycle one programs which will be focused on high rush quasars uh, for a total at least that I could recover of more than 500 hours on this uh, on this type of sources. Another interesting uh, era that we will have in the future is the 30 meter class telescope era. Uh, and here I show you the GMT and the ELT that will be uh, here in Chile. And the um, fascinating part is that in this case, we will be able to have detailed studies of the proven regions and black holes, also of the faintest objects. Because again, I have shown you the very uh, brightest high shaped quasars, but we know at least so far very little of the properties of the uh, fainter objects. And at the same time, we can uh, study their environments with uh, larger, relatively large field of view. Um, facilities such as the GMT where uh, fibers can be uh, placed basically over a large uh, range uh, with respect to other um, to other instruments. And finally, uh, we will not only study objects that we already know and have discovered, but there's going to be new space missions and new surveys that are going to allow us to find a uh, um, larger number of quasars, in particular, for instance, the Vera Rubin Observatory, XLSST, that will allow us to uh, find the larger number of the uh, fainter quasars at uh, redshift uh, lower than seven, roughly. And also the Euclid mission will allow us to find the quasars up to to uh, redshift, uh, redshift 9. And another very interesting point is that new X-ray uh, surveys will allow us to uh, find uh, high redshift quasars, also focusing on the X-ray, which will give uh, a complementary uh, selection with respect to um, UV and optical-based selection so far. And uh, yeah, I leave you again here the summary of the talk. And uh, I thank you for your attention for this uh, a long talk and uh, I wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara. Very, very interesting talk. Uh, so, yep, yeah, from the audience, does anybody want to go ahead and uh, ask any question? Chiara? I have, uh, yes, two hands at the same time. Uh, Vasily, okay. Okay. so let's start Carolina, for example. Thanks, woman first. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, Chiara. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, I'm not very expert on this field, so maybe my question will be a bit naive. Um, very interesting, the, this sample of high receive quasar where you that you show us that they have this uh, companion some uh, kiloparsec mm -hmm. away uh, mm -hmm. do you have any information on the uh, galaxy morphology of the of the companion uh, yes thank you for the question carolina so the um, morphology of the companions uh, that we can okay uh, we can get basically from the um, from the ALMA observations, uh, because so far uh, there's only basically one companion that we have observed in the uh, in the HST, so as the frame UV, and uh, it's uh, basically point like in that case. Uh, but for instance, uh, you see here that we have uh, um, actually quite a variety of morphology and kinematics also, because thanks to the C plus line, we can also learn about the kinematics. Uh, we have companions in which, uh, um, I don't have the plot here, but basically the companion of J2100 that has a very ordered uh, uh, rotation. So it seemed a rotation disk basically at a high redshift, but we also have companions of uh, 231, for instance, of or 167 that are very disturbed and already already in a um, basically emerging morphology with them. So it seems uh, that there's a, not a unique either morphology or kinematics of these uh, uh, very massive uh, companion galaxies around the quasar. Another interesting question that we have asked ourselves is that, okay, these uh, <clears throat> companion galaxies and the host galaxy of the quasar are very similar when we just observe them in ALMA. So why one has a quasar and the other has not? And there has been some claims of detections of X-ray 
from some of the companions, which would mean that there is a quasar that is like an AGN, but it's actually heavily obscured. And uh, that would be an interesting uh, thing to explore in the future with, um, with uh, longer exposure observations, because um, uh, these X-ray detections are like a few photons. Uh, but yeah, I hope I have answered your question. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe Basilis, wanna go ahead? Yes, uh, Chiara, thank you very much, an excellent talk. I was also wondering uh, about the issue of the companions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. my, my question is that, first of all, you said that the RCD resembles the one of uh, R220, the yes. G of six, which basically suggests that these are uh, warm objects, right? Yes. And uh, in most galaxies, I was under the impression that at high Z is they are more gas rich. Yes. You wouldn't expect them to be warm. Actually, the R220 SED, uh, at least in the local universe or intermediate redshift, is not very heavily used because of its really peculiarity. So one was, how do you explain the warm part? Is it the interaction, for example, that uh, it's an ephemeral event? And also along the same discussions, uh, the point that Carolina uh, asked and then you alluded to, since uh, the QSOs identify the most dense regions at the universe at the time, right? At least mm -hmm. in the fluctuations. Isn't it kind of surprising that you have a, a possibly early type galaxy fairly evolved, which managed to have a supermassive black hole of probably more than 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine solar masses. And then you, you to also have a, a very gas rich system at the same area, which did not really evolve that much, right? It, 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 is it just all inflows and material that comes into the central potential? And it so happens that uh, one galaxy becomes a late type uh, gas rich uh, detected by ALMA. Uh, yes, okay. I, I'll, I'll try to answer to the two points that you raised regarding the. Um, the SEDs and the warm gas, it is, uh, again, also for us, it was quite surprising to see, um, first of all, the companions at all. And secondly, that um, we could not uh, detect any emission that could resemble to anything which was not our to 20 like uh, galaxies. So we were also surprised ourselves. And in the terms of uh, um, the, uh, emission recovered by ALMA. Uh, basically, in the case of the quasar, uh, we have evidence, or we think we have evidence that the uh, emission uh, we, that, that we detect is mainly due to uh, the heating from the star formation happening in the galaxy. And so I wouldn't be so surprised then if the uh, properties of the host and the properties of the uh, of the companions are similar in terms of SED and also temperature, maybe if both of them are uh, due to the star for, to the star formation, or better, if there's not a large um, a, a large input from the quasar in the case of the host galaxy. And in terms of the very evolved uh, sources, I think it is a matter again of. Um, what you said, the presence of um, large uh, reservoirs of gas. And the um, the presence of uh, the um, basically a faster uh, accretion in this uh, in this type of uh, very biased uh, uh, regions. And what I'm wondering as well is, is it's also terms of uh, um, cause and consequences. Uh, we can observe them because they are in this. Uh, um, in this very uh, merging state, which might be uh, triggering a stronger in, um, stronger inflows in the black holes, and therefore like a stronger emission and the faster accretion, etc. Uh, but at the same time, not all of these very powerful uh, quasars are found uh, in uh, overdense environments, or at least uh, in uh, merging systems, like the one of the um, strongest uh, in terms of UV. Uh, so emission from the quasar itself uh, and the accretion disk is actually found in a galaxy that we cannot detect so far in the in ALMA. So um, it is still, uh, I think, uh, uh, premature at least to have a one-on-one -on -one 
connection between between the two. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Constantinos. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask what is the accretion disk model that is usually invoked in order to, to understand the emission? Uh, um, yeah, so the, in, in, we have not used the accretion disk model modeling in order to derive the black hole mass. Uh, which is uh, over the decretion rate, etc., which could be another very interesting uh, uh, thing to explore. Uh, we have uh, used uh, local relations that uh, rely on basically uh, reverberation mapping and broad lines uh, emission, and basically a uh, thin disk. We do not, uh, but we do not explore the modeling of the accretion disk and so of the continuum emission uh, itself. I see. So, um, if you had a slim disk model for these yes. near Reddington uh, sources, I would assume that the um, with this extreme uh, black hole masses, uh, the emission uh, from the disk itself should be, if not comparable, higher than the emission uh, of the star forming um, regions. And possibly could ionize and keep the region, yes, the galaxy, yes. even more because yes, these yes. are yes. This is the red six is around the point where uh, AGN become predominantly the heaters of the universe instead of uh, star formation. Yes, completely. I, I I completely agree. So in it's I I think there's. Um, three points. One is yes, the uh, emission from the accretion disk in the UV is outshining the emission from the uh, from the, host, the the stars, for instance. Like it's it's extremely bright; we cannot see the stars uh, at all. So yes, this is an extremely uh, bright and uh, um, let's say uh, dominant emission that ionizes. Uh, uh, regions, which is the second point that ionizes the region of a few megaparsec around uh, the quasar itself, which is a small proximity zone. So yes, this is totally uh, true. And at the same time, that's why we, um, like especially uh, Bram Venemans, for instance, and others, have tried to uh, constrain the um, source of the ionization, uh, so the ionization radiation of what we observed uh, in, uh, in ALMA, uh, because you have Again, the case in which this is in, due to the emission from the uh, from the quasar or the, from the accretion disk or from the star formation, and basically you you may be able, for instance, to look I think at Venemans 2016, uh, where they do this um, thanks to different emission lines and. Uh, uh, comparing it to models of what is expected from uh, XDR regions and photodissociation region. Um, it seemed that the emission, at least from the objects that uh, or the quasars of galaxy that were considered were more consistent or were consistent with uh, PDRs. So due to um, emission radiation from the stars and not from the, uh, and, and not from the Christian disk itself. But at the same time, uh, I think that it's uh, the objects that were um, that were considered were uh, were still um, few for these uh, uh, for these studies. It's not like the uh, the general C plus or continuum that have been detected. I think over fifty objects. These are still uh, like few. I think less than ten. Thank I don't you very know much. If I explained myself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I yes. Hope. Uh... Thank you. We we'll look at the references. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can I, I can write you more precise references because I don't have that on top of my head. I have the plot, but not the name exactly. But uh, I can I can search it. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone uh, have more questions? Otherwise, I would like to. Uh, just a, a, from the depth of the current observations with ALMA, what is, what is the, 
how how let's say how strong of a star forming galaxy you would have to have as a host let's say mm. in order to outshine the the emission from the agn either in the optical or in the infrared somehow do you mm -hmm. have an idea from the top of your head maybe it's not easy to yeah I, like on top of my head star formation um the rates that we basically observe in these sources are few hundreds, like it's solar mass superior. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, like the source that the companion that we detect also in the UV, for instance, had a far infrared star formation rate of uh, 60 solar masses per year and in the UV of 10. Um, so in, I, I'm wondering uh, if these are the numbers or we can go much fainter because I don't have on top of my head like the limits of the star formation in case of no detection at all in ANMA. So yeah, sorry. No, no, that's fine. I, uh, another uh, uh, maybe a spe very specific uh, question. At the beginning of your talk, you, you mentioned that you were seeing some absorption uh, in the UV yes. spectra that were uh, blue shifted with respect to the carbon-4 line, which was already blue shifted in itself. <laughs> From the... Yeah. So basically, you can you can see you can see it here in the in the spectra. Uh, like these are the big. You have a blue shift of the C four line and a large throw. Mm -hmm. uh, I can never say this word in English. Um, which is a uh, uh, ball close to the uh, close to the C four. Uh, which I'm I'm not a big. I am not, I'm not an expert at all on BAL, but basically it seems that this velocity is uh, uh, 0.1, they have estimated, or almost 0.2, the velocity of light. And uh, I, yeah, this is a very weird spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it, this is a particular object? Uh... This is the highest redshift object known, actually. Oh. Yeah. There are other sources now that we have been delving in um, program, which is called XQR30, uh, which observes like 30 quasars with uh, 10 hours of the VLT. And there's a, actually a larger fraction that we thought of quasars with these extreme morphologies, or even seen with uh, a large obscuration with strange like shape of the power law of the, sorry, of the continuum. So like the presence of this straw might be more general than we thought, but this in particular is quite extreme. I see. Very interesting. Okay. Um, anyone else has uh, more questions? If not, uh, I think we can, uh, we can, uh, stop the recording and thank you very much uh, Chiara for uh, for the very great presentation uh, yep thank you very much thanks to you for listening thank you very much